My name is Jason McCaffrey and this is part of a series on the productive economy, politics and economics. And I'd like to consider, um, I think that is coming down the track to us. Automation, artificial intelligence. You've heard a lot about this and you've heard some of the political solutions that have been put forward. I've written a chapter in my book about it, so without me having to remember all that's in the chapter, I thought I'd just explain a few parts of it to you. The studies are, you know, many that say that um, jobs will be automated within a decade or so. Um, Merrill Lynch says 45% of manufacturing jobs will be automated. The Oxford University and Deloitte think 35%. Um, on the other hand, the OECD say it'll only be 9%. A number of, uh, of other people say that the premise that they'll destroy jobs isn't necessarily so. Um, the things that destroy jobs are over-regulation by the state, uh, the removal of funds by financialization and things like the Wall Street crash, and they are cutting job numbers in greater numbers than in automation. There are other threats, and they are, are real. If you look at the productivity from uh, automation, well, it's prodigious. And everyone thinks, oh, heavens above, this will be the greatest technological transformation in human history. Well, no, it won't. Not thus far. So far, the greatest transformation in human history caused by technology was between 1850 and 1910. And that was dramatic. Railways. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people moved from using sickles and scythes on farms. And McCormick invented the, the, the combine harvester. There was an astonishing automation in, in agriculture. And then there was the growth of the automobile industry, the spread of trains. That was the greatest transformation caused by technology. A few people wandering around with their iPads have, have nothing on it. And so it's happened before. Farming used to employ 70% 70, 70 of, uh, of the people in the economy. Now it's only 3%. We adjusted to that adjustment. What happened was that new sectors in the productive economy opened up. Because remember, it's an adaptive organic, environmental, development uh, sort of organism. And it's got millions of people in it, making millions of decisions. So the wisdom is dispersed. And little niche opportunities are seen by people on the ground with heuristic, tacit wisdom, uh, dealing with the circumstances they have about them. Not with mass deductive logic theories pushed down from the top, but growing out and developing, evolving, using the intelligence and the minds of individuals and little groups that collect in enterprises and companies to see the opportunities of new technology or, or new economic uh, advances. And the productive economy has done that extraordinarily well for 150 years. After the war in Germany, when for a brief period of time there was real economic theory, uh, freedom, um, the effort, the, uh, the economics minister produced the, uh, what was called, I think, the uh, German Wissenschaft. This economy that mushroomed up by the middle 1950s, West Germany was, was back in industrial uh, production, and that has continued ever since. It's a strong, resilient economy based on the opportunities in the productive economy. And, for instance, John Tammany says that it's not going to be a replacement of jobs, It'll be complementary. It'll be an augmentation, as one other, uh, Arden Manning says. In other words, you'll have something augmenting what you do, not taking the job away from you, but taking the dreary, dreadful bits out of it, like cutting sheep's throats, and getting you back to something that's more uh, commensurate with, with human intelligence and abilities. Uh, so what is the problem? I mean, the world isn't a, a wash with ostlers and horse minders uh, following the adoption of the uh, automobile. And the next fallacy you find coming along is, this time it's different. Oh dear, it's totally unlike everything that had been happened in human history, and this time it's different. Oh no, it's not. This time you've still got those humans out there, and they still do much of the same things they did yesterday, and will continue doing the same things tomorrow. Putting a reef over their head, seeing to get a few bob in the bank, and meeting their everyday needs of their households. Um, it is true that this technology is um, 
if you like, material light. Uh, 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 there was once a VCR player with hundreds of mechanical little bits in it, and then it became a DVD, which is just a disc with a thing, and now it's just a space on a, on a hard drive or a download from Spotify or Netflix. That is true, and, and people like Kodak got wiped out when, they, when the chemical processing of photography, I mean, hell, they invented it, but they just left it to other people, and all photography is digital, and you can send them across the world in the blink of an eye. You don't have to go to the chemist and wait a week to get them developed. And then there's Morvax paradox. And this is quite an interesting one. It says the hardest things to automate are cleaning office buildings, for instance. They're very complex spatial sort of interfaces between people and equipment and chemicals and God knows what. Those are hard to automate. But the ones like um, home loan calculation and drawing up legal contracts and looking through uh, previous legal precedents, oh, these can be automated real easy. Well, the lawyers are the ones who should be watching out, perhaps, rather than the cleaners. Um, and there are solutions to it, and these I would put forward some of them. Apart from the one I just explained, that the productive economy will continue doing exactly what it's done for 200 years, adapting, innovating, moving forward, taking advantage of the niches available. That is one solution. But there'll be whole new industries which we can't think about because we don't know what they are. They have names and, and doing things that we cannot imagine because they're not here yet. The future's like that. As very few people get a few ticks for prophecy, and the number of false prophets are, are legion, because the future has no advocate for it. you get got lots of people standing up that have to renovate the past and pay money for the guilt and good and, and do all sorts of things about the past. A number of people telling us what we should do in the present. But there's no one to come into this room and say, I am from the future, and this is what I advocate because this is what will happen. Hasn't happened yet. It's like T.S. Eliot, between the moment and the hand. But never mind. Mikhail Freeberg talks about the indigo economy. It's a fascinating one where innovators with sound intellects and in structures that are free of corruption and with the rule of law can create new products for globalised customers. And the indigo generation, opportunities for enormous wealth for some character in his bedroom in Mumbai selling something to people in California. And we don't know what that is, because it hasn't come into being yet. Um, you know, there's, there's, we could never have foreseen. I, I ran an internet magazine in the 19, late 1970s, uh, sorry, 1990s, when the internet was just blossoming. And some of the applications and things, some of them which went broke because they went capitalised, the people couldn't run them, or they, they, people weren't ready for that particular product, were utterly astonishing. I mean, I remember one thing that cropped up, it was uh, Jerry and David's Guide to the World Wide Web. It turned out to be Yahoo. Um, and there was enormous uh, uh, development that came out of Yahoo. Unfortunately, it passed into inferior management, it seems to disappear somewhere. So there have been new industries and jobs in cyberspace. But another thing that David seems to be keeping their eye on is there will be enormous opportunities in the uh, developing world. When places like that utter hellhole of Equatorial Guinea get sound governments, decent accounting, the rule of law and property rights, they will do as anyone else has done in such circumstances. Their, their productive economy will, will mushroom overnight. Uh, Kenya seems to be starting the first vestiges of that, and to their credit, Botswana has done an astonishing job of decent government, uh, sound productive economy, uh, and, and prosperity for the people who've had it. Uh, and the socialism that was visited at, uh, on Tanzania by that thoroughly nice man, Julius Nairiri, is just being recovered from, and it's been recovered from by opening up the potential of a productive economy. And there's a, a billion customers there, and they need um, pipe water, they need sewage, they need proper housing, and they need paved roads, they need uh, electrical uh, generation systems, and they will help to build them, but I am sure that the rest of the world will be able to sell them products and create employment, because they will have money to buy it. Uh, as opposed to pouring foreign aid in 
destroying their economy, taking the aid from poor people in the industrial companies, and, and just fostering corruption and waste. Courier systems will be able to get you something from Equatorial Guinea to, to uh, wherever. It won't be a problem. And small businesses will have opportunities in these uh, spaces because the capital costs have come down. Well, you need a computer, internet connections, all sorts of things. You need the raw material, perhaps. But slowly coming into, do, into view uh, the Amazon possibilities of worldwide delivery of, of uh, production. And you need what the, what the productive economy's basic ingredients are. Uh, you need property rights. You need economic and, to a degree, personal freedom. You need freedom from war and dictatorship, which is the curse of Africa. And you need an ethos which respects the productive economy, the hard-working people in it, and the owners and investors who make it possible. So I think, and also, of course, there's demographics. There's all this terrible thing about all us old people, and, uh, and vast mushroomy numbers of them. Well, I want to tell you something terrible. We're all going to die, you know, anyway. But in about 70 years from now, this vast bulge of old people in the developed world will all be gone. There'll be a small number of younger people who I do believe will be well employed, very beneficially employed, well paid, and will inherit all the assets that we're used to own. Where do you think those assets are going to go? So there you are. That's the possible solutions. We could have public enterprises, we could have social enterprises, we could have mushrooming opportunities to solve many of the social problems we have, as long as it's not state bureaucrats taking control and politicians using them as voting buying pools. The nightmare of artificial intelligence, of automation, of robotics, would be universal basic income. That would destroy us utterly, and let me explain why. It's sort of like the slave empire of Rome, you know, uh, breeding circuses, keep the masses, but the only difference is, at least the Roman emperor got his stuff from Egypt, from outside the economy. He wasn't taxing the living daylights out of, out of the uh, plebs, uh, says the plebs would have a few circuses. It was his own money, and he bought it overseas. What would happen is you would pass all these people, some of them directly from school, they would leave school, go directly on universal benefit, augment their income with a bit of uh, interesting enterprises, not all of which would be legal and some of which would be definitely criminal, uh, to try and get by, and they would be written off. 20% of the population now leaves the school uh, practically illiterate, uh, unskilled, with no prospects, or well, they'd be cemented in for life. At least under the current system, there's some expectation at some stage there's a possibility that they should actually work. And it would have the same effects as I've described for Ballymun, Outback Australia, the projects of St. Louis, Baltimore, Detroit, Newark, uh, Glasgow. It would destroy people as the state maintenance of people who are able to work has always done, does now, and will continue to do. It would also be this vote-buying pool where politicians would move vast sums of money from the productive economy into the able-bodied welfare uh, passive pool of voters, and there would be a great political gain from it for that particular uh, view of politics in those parties. But it would be hell on earth uh, for the rest of them. So there you are. Um, it's in some ways not such a worry, in some ways it's a tremendous opportunity for millions of people. Hell, some of them could go and buy a robot and rent it out to people. Uh, they can invent all sorts of other little robots. They could invent means of automation, they could have little businesses that do that. It is a tremendous opportunity for the most adaptive, the most capable, the most energetic organism we have ever created, the productive economy. And in there is the dispersed wisdom of billions of people, millions upon millions of enterprises, who every day get up in the morning and look for the opportunity to add value to their lives themselves, through taxes to their community, and it is resilient. It is anti-fragile in, in Nassib Talib's uh, description. It is the hope of the future, and it is where automation will be handled 
better or worse, one can never tell. But if you wanted to sit in a horse and buggy behind a horse, farting away, shitting all over the countryside, as the alternative of driving a small little Kia with the stereo and the coffee cup and the power steering and the power brakes and the 22 degrees and the climate control, you're more than welcome to do that. We have no idea what's coming, but at least we can face it with courage, with the courage of those people in the productive economy, instead of handing our future over like helots and slaves to bureaucrats and governments and politicians and academics with a very strange idea of what they think is good for us about a world they have never been in.